this is the first in our uh, Security and International Relations Programme seminar series, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome Professor Rosemary Hollis to give the first in this year's um, seminars. Uh, professor Hollis is a Professor of Middle East Policy Studies and Director of the Olive Tree Scholarship Programme at City University, and her research focuses on international political and security issues in the Middle East, particularly European, EU, UK and US relations with the region. She previously worked as Director of Research at Chatham House, and her book, Britain and the Middle East in the 9-11 Era, um, was published in 2010. In the um, publicity uh, email that I sent around for this uh, seminar, I mentioned an article of uh, uh, Professor Hollis's that I highly recommend. It's in International Affairs. If anybody wants the full title details, please let me know. But it's, it's on um, related issues and well worth reading. Uh, as I'm sure her book is as well. So, um, without further ado, I'm delighted to um, hand the floor over to uh, Professor Hollis. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, actually, I'm going to use a lot of material that appears in that article that Aidan's just mentioned. Uh, if I remember correctly, the article is called Helpful or Harmful, the EU Role in the Genesis of the Arab Revolts. And the argument that I want to advance here, well, this is basically what I'm going to try and cover here, which is my central argument, and a little bit of the context in terms of the background, the European Union's various initiatives for the Mediterranean, which are the most important EU initiatives for consideration in terms of the genesis of the Arab revolts, as opposed to any EU initiatives in the Persian Gulf, which are pretty minimal compared with what they've been up to in the Mediterranean. And their overall agenda for counter-terrorism and migration control, which is key to understanding how they've got embedded in the politics of the Arab world. And then, in terms of reacting to the actual revolts, I've just finished a little piece of work on the British case, so I'll draw on some examples from that, from which you can read across to what you think the performance of other Europeans has been at a bilateral level in terms of responses to the Arab revolts. So, the argument that I'm advancing here is that there should clearly be celebration in Europe as a result of what happened from late 2010 and all the way through 2011, given that the European Union's stated goals over many years for their relationships in the Mediterranean included to create an area of shared prosperity, to promote job creation, economic growth, freedom of expression and assembly, respect for human rights, accountable government, transparency and the rule of law. And after all, in the Arab revolts, the slogans and chants featured freedom, dignity, justice, jobs, and an end to dictatorships. Hence, I believe, there should have been calls for celebration. However, if you look at actual EU policies over the years, there has been a consistent prioritization of European economic interests, of security, of migration control, such that I would even argue that the European Union policies helped to trigger the so-called Arab Spring, but not by intention, rather by default. And when it happened, as the UK case demonstrates, they were reactive, they reacted differently, case by case, pursued bilateral relationships, and I'm arguing in the case of the British, if there's a common denominator across British reactions to the Arab revolts across the region, it has been 
their placing of emphasis or preference for the integrity of the state system above and beyond the interests of the people who came out in the streets and demonstrated for the fall of the dictators. So, my argument here is that the net result overall constitutes a set of structured, institutionalized, and securitized relationships which will be very difficult to reconfigure and will not help Arab reformers to attain their goals. Now we can go into that a little bit if you like, but during the course of the intervention in Libya, for example, there were meetings with the Libyan Transitional Council to discuss would they honor agreements previously reached with the Gaddafi regime about controlling migration from sub-Saharan Africa so that it would not reach the shores, if at all possible, of Europe. And I'm also arguing that it would be a little strange to try and reach an understanding of Europe's role over the last two years in a vacuum. One needs to understand the relationships and structures and institutionalizations that had gone, uh, had been built up over the years prior to the outbreak of the demonstrations. And even though the British government, for example, declared that they had been obliged to rethink their policy and they felt that they in future should not regard dictatorships as valuable for stability and should be more supportive of democratization. I don't really think, examining what the British have done, that they have indeed effected a complete new term. Let's look at the context. We're looking at Europe in relation to its closest Arab neighbors. Now Europe itself had progressively perfected the state system in preference to the empires that dominated the world up until the last two centuries. So at the beginning of the 20th century, specifically in the 1920s, Europe's big idea for the area previously pretty much overseen by the Ottoman Empire was states as opposed to democracy. If Europe looked like this, then the Arab world needed to look like this. It had looked like that, where the green is the Ottoman Empire, which had contracted considerably since its heyday. The pink is where Britain was principally in charge. And you'll notice in the heartland of the Arabian Peninsula, nobody was really in charge. This is how it looked after the various agreements and meetings and the designs produced principally by the British and the French to reconfigure the region, chop it up into states. And Iraq and Jordan in particular are British inventions. That's the background, the context. Europe, in other words, was effectively implicated in the dividing up of the Arab world into separate states. In fact, by 2010, I would argue, those states, those separate states, had achieved <coughs> a level of permanence. They had certainly 
caused Syrians to describe themselves as Syrians and to distinguish themselves from Iraqis or Jordanians. There was a certain identification and on the part of the successive regimes in these separate Arab states, the legitimization process had involved anti-imperialism, getting rid of the British or the French, anti-Israel stance, depicting Israel as an instrument of imperialism, and Arab nationalism, self-determination. But in order to distinguish themselves and provide legitimacy to underpin the separate regimes in each of these states, a lot of things went on which were conducive of dictatorship. After all, people had not previously identified themselves as Syrians, as opposed to Jordanians, as opposed to Palestinians, as opposed to what became Saudis, and so on. And the different regimes put their stamp on their states in ways that were essentially competitive with each other to be the better protector of Islam, in the case of Saudi vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians, to be uh, the better protector of Arab national interests in terms of socialism in the cases of Iraq and Syria. To be at the forefront of the Arab campaign on behalf of the Palestinians, perhaps. In any case, by the time the European Union had reached the stage of deciding that they needed a policy initiative for the Mediterranean, and what they meant by this was a policy initiative for their immediate neighbors who were not members of the Union, not European, and not likely to become so. So after the end of the Cold War, European Union expands to include the Central Asian states previously under Soviet remit. But then the question was what to do about Belarus and Ukraine. Nervousness about including them. Let's have a policy for our near neighbors who are not members or as yet candidate members. And then there was a read across, well, maybe we need something similar for the Mediterranean. Morocco, after all, did actually challenge the European Union to say, can we become members? And so Europe needs to define itself in relation to the other, but think of a mechanism by which to establish friendly relations. And in the mid-1990s, through the, ba the Barcelona Declaration, they come up with this formula for partnership between the Europeans on the one hand and the Arab neighboring countries or Mediterranean neighboring countries because it included initially Turkey, much to their irritation, and Israel. And places like Malta, which then uh, got incorporated and Cyprus into the Union. So the idea was to turn the Mediterranean into this shared geopolitical, strategic, and economic space, a new creation. But the trouble was that the European Union was so much far advanced now, not only in the business of statehood, but in the business of amalgamating states uh, at some level into a union. And therefore, the initiatives after signing this partnership agreement tended to come from Europe, making Europe the hub on individual Arab states plus Israel, finding themselves in bilateral relations uh, or the hub and spokes model, with the spokes connecting individual states to the hub of Europe. In their conduct of the economic aspect of the Euro-Mediterranean partnership, the Europeans fought and succeeded in protecting, fought for and succeeded in protecting uh, some special interests inside Europe, which included the farming sector in southern Europe, for whom North Africa would represent our welcome competition. 
Whereas inside Europe, you had the free movement of goods, of capital, of labor, and then of services, or at least the objective was of services. For the neighbors, there was to be free movement of capital. Uh, there was to be free movement of most goods, but not these agricultural products, for example. But there was to be no free movement of labor. So those of us looking at this initiative back in the 1990s wanted to know how can you have, how can you export half a model? If the European Union internal model says free movement of all these things and you create a wonderful win-win uh, situation within, how's it going to work if you control some things and have freedom of movement for the others? And in fact, the hidden agenda did appear to be that it was about throwing money at a problem and trying to throw money at the North African states in particular to get them to keep their people at home. And if there could be job generation on the southern rim of the Mediterranean, the logic was they wouldn't want to migrate north. Now, there was also concern inside the Arab economies that if they became open to European investment, what was to happen to the profits of their activities in the North African states and would these be repatriated? And some hard bargains were concluded which meant that actually there was not that much job creation as a result of the inward investment in the end. Now, between the creation of the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership in 1995 and the creation of the Union for the Mediterranean, which was the brainchild of Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, there was another invention, which was the European Neighborhood Policy. But let me simply say that the Union for the Mediterranean was supposed to supplant and incorporate the Euromed partnership and in actual fact represented a regression from it insofar as it elevated relationships to the government to government level and prioritized a few headline grabbing projects for investment but was in a sense a, an acknowledgement of defeat for the original vision of a shared economic space, let alone uh, the vision of actually having prompted significant political reform, including, in effect, democratization, certainly rule of law and accountability for the governments in the Arab countries. The European neighborhood policy that I just mentioned that followed on from the Euromed partnership, this came in the context of the invasion of Iraq in 2003. It was kind of prompted by the Americans saying that they were going to have a big reform initiative, partly to justify the invasion of Iraq, for the Arab world, which they then turned into the great reform initiative for the greater Middle East, which was to cover a huge region. And they were going to put a certain amount of money into this. The Europeans took umbrage and said, we've been at this business of trying to prompt good governance and transparency and end corruption and loosen dictatorships for ages. And we're putting a great deal more money into it in terms of investment. But they had to acknowledge that this one-size-fits-all element in the Euromed partnership hadn't produced <coughs> results. And one of the explanations, they thought, was that the different Arab countries were at such different stages of development, the qualities in each of them were <coughs> distinguishable, and they wanted what they called a differentiated policy that would account for that. So they came up with this 
new initiative whereby Brussels, in this case the Commission, not the politicians, would work out in partnership with individual Arab states and Israel an action plan and they would pump money into measures taken by the partner states in accordance with this action plan. They would be rewarded with money. So technically, there was to be some conditionality. But in the drafting of the action plans, you see the absence of conditionality on anything to do with political opening, with the independence of the judiciary, anything to do with detentions without trial uh, or torture in detention. And I know from having done a study of how the Arabs regarded this neighborhood policy, they reacted very negatively to the essence of the formula, which was that every single bit of the acquis communitaire, and you all know what I mean by that, I mean the body of law that every single EU member has to absorb into their domestic law in order to be a member, which I'm told, you know, if you printed it out, is about this tall in terms of legislation in small print. The commission cherry-picked from this body of law some bits that they thought would make a short list for the Arab partner countries, partner countries to choose a shorter list from. Now, because the acquis communitaire is not translated in toto into Arabic, the Arab partner states were blind on what they were being denied in terms of possibilities for legislation. They were also being presented with a collection of measures that the Europeans would as the Europeans assumed were good in their own right. There was an implicit assumption here on the part of the Europeans that every bit of EU legislation that we've all absorbed is good, is positive. So if you have a little bit of it, you will feel a little bit of the benefits. And the conditionality meant that the big reward held out was that as you, the Arab states, and Israel progressively harmonize with the conditions that run the internal market in the European Union, we will give you greater access to that internal market. The washing machines or the pharmaceutical products that you are producing will meet European standards and therefore will be able uh, to have free access to the European market. There's built into there um, some assumptions of a superiority, some orientalism on the part of the Europeans. And as the Egyptians were particularly astute at pointing out, you don't seem to realize that uh, the European Union is not value free, that the acquis communautaire is not value free. And actually, if you look back at the history of Europe, it has a lot to do with Christian values. We as Arabs don't want to be Europeans, and we as Arabs and Muslims don't regard all of your heritage as relevant to us. The net effect was that the Arab regimes negotiated very cleverly with the Commission and resisted incorporating into the action plans any of the political requirements that the Europeans hope to sneak in about human rights and accountability. Now, I can see that 
I'm not going to get through a separate discussion of Europe and its role in the Middle East peace process. Let me simply say, because it's relevant to the Arab revolts, the way the European Union funded the political authority, leaving the high-level diplomacy essentially to the Americans, over 20 years prior to the Arab revolts, one way or another, since the Madrid Peace Conference, and especially since Oslo, has meant that without meaning to, the Europeans have tended to perpetuate the occupation as opposed to end it. And their efforts to pump money into building a Palestinian state have had the effect of postponing it as opposed to realizing it. And the reaction that the Europeans had to the Palestinian election of early 2006, when the winners were Hamas, uh, sent a big message out around the rest of the Arab world. Uh, they talk about democracy, but it's only when it produces the results that they like. Simultaneously, the Europeans, at a bilateral level, as well as at a collective level, were putting in place all sorts of measures, including writing them into the ENP action plans, whereby the southern partner states, the Mediterranean partner states, would agree to control migrants at their end so that the Europeans didn't have to turn them away in boats or process them inside Europe. And the priority accorded to migration control rocketed up the scale in any case as a result of 9-11 and progressively Europeans discovering that radicalization was a phenomenon in their midst. It wasn't something that only happened in Afghanistan or Pakistan. And there's been a read across which still exists, and you're studying here at a British university, so you know that the UK border agency is instrumental in the whole business of trying to prevent foreigners from outside the European Union making their way into Britain to study or for whatever other reason for fear that they stay and because there's a kind of assumption that if more and more Muslims come there will more, be more and more social unrest and um, we know from the British case that as of 9-11 and especially as of 7-7 in 2005 the government has made it known that it really doesn't wish to hear about British Muslims' opinions of British foreign policy. So this is the political aspect of the relationships between Europe and the Arab countries around the Mediterranean. And it included deals with dictators. Now this gives away any possibility of requesting reform on the part of the Arab dictators. It fuels the cynicism that you get amongst the Arab people. And enabled Mubarak in particular, but also uh, the Algerian, the Tunisian, even the Libyan government, to argue to the Europeans, you want us to protect you from radicals? Don't beat me up about the methods we use in our jails or about detention of the Muslim brothers in Egypt. And uh, I, I interviewed a number of British and American officials who dealt with Mubarak, and they both told me, um, both the Americans and the Brits told me, that when they raised the subject of detention without trial and mistreatment of detainees in Egypt, Mubarak and his government consistently replied, you worry about your own backyard. You're not very good at countering terrorism and mind your own business when it comes to Egypt. 
Now this meant that, and I've got here a quote from an academic called Tuba Basaran, who's worked on this quite considerably, uh, that the border zones between Europe and North Africa and beyond, but the border zones are characterized by legal <laughs> proliferation rather than being outside the law, by juridical complicity rather than executives <laughs> acting on their own, and often also international consensus rather than unilateral approaches by states. There's a buy-in to a collective structuring of the relationships such that you get a set of structured, institutionalized, and securitized relationships and activities which infuse and overlay all aspects of EU relations with neighboring Arab states and the occupied Palestinian territories. And in the case of the UK, for example, in addition to this EU region-wide set of structures, there were some bilateral UK Arab, French Arab, Spanish Arab permutations uh, spearheaded by their representatives in these countries and their security personnel working in cooperation with the Arab security personnel. Now, the British are still fond of telling you, the Foreign Office British that is, uh, we pride ourselves on our pragmatism. We pride ourselves on working on the art of the possible as opposed to idealism. And so I'm saying, oops, do I get rid of that? Just the space. Ah, oh, brilliant. Idea. <laughs> I'm saying, therefore, in terms of Europe's role in the genesis of the Arab Spring, the problem is not simply one of omission, or that the EU could have done more to promote economic development and democracy, even if its intentions were benign. I'm saying that instead, the case I'm making is that EU policies have actually betrayed the professed European values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law, rather than exporting them. And they prioritize European prosperity and stability at the expense of both the Arab world, <coughs> oh, at the expense of both prosperity and stability in the Arab world. So my big question, therefore, is, now that Europe has made friends with the new government in Tunisia, what's to stop them still prioritizing prosperity and stability in Europe? They are making all sorts of encouraging noises to the Tunisians, but I don't see any European companies or security forces prioritizing prosperity, job creation, and social stability in Tunisia ahead of all of those things inside their own countries and Europe as a whole. It is to be expected. And there has been the financial meltdown. We are in the midst of the Euro crisis it seems insane to expect British politicians, British companies, their continental counterparts to say it's in the long-term good, to argue to their publics, it's in the long-term good of Europe that we buy more of what Tunisians produce so that they have jobs rather than what the unemployed of Northern England or uh, the suburbs of Paris could be producing if only they were employed. 
So it's almost going to be another sad story. I'll conclude now with a few lessons that I've drawn from the case of the European Unions, which is essentially illustrating what I've just said. The fact that the, 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 the British were taken by surprise is indicative in itself. How is it that they assumed that the populations of these countries could go on indefinitely, putting up with getting poorer, putting up with the gap between the rich few and the poor many getting wider, the corruption, and the relative privilege in Europe, and not resist? I don't know about you, but I, for one, was terribly relieved when they did. I thought it was an explosion waiting to happen in most of these places. Egyptians have been telling me in 2006 that it was an explosion waiting to happen in Egypt, uh, and they anticipated it could come before Mubarak died, but since he was going to have to die at some point, and there was going to have to be a succession at some point, uh, that would surely mark the occasion of the explosion. They could not see how it could be a stable transition. Uh, I, I think, therefore, uh, there is reason to question why wasn't this anticipated? How was it that it was assumed that it could go on the way it was? However, it wasn't anticipated, and the British were taken by surprise in the case of Tunisia and Egypt. But since they had no power to dictate the outcome of the revolution or revolts, whatever you want to call them, in Tunisia and Egypt, they had no choice but to adapt to the outcome. What is perhaps concerning is that the British and the European Union are now introducing the conditionality that they felt they should have had more of in terms of political openness and transparency and accountability and human rights. They felt they should have had more of under the dictators. So they're introducing it now that the leaders are elected, which has not been received well, as you can imagine because these people have only come to power as a result of resisting dictatorship. And to be told that they will only get support from the European Union insofar as they behave better than the dictators is rather strange. It might. In Morocco and Jordan, the monarchies reacted to the Arab Spring by saying, OK, OK, more reform. We'll do it. We'll lead it. We're on our way, uh, you know, in the case of Jordan, yet another new prime minister uh, and new cabinet. Uh, this happens repeatedly. Uh, and in Morocco, they've been opening up to political party participation in the parliament and elections anyway, so they said, more, we will have more, which gets the British and other Europeans off the hook. The monarchies are leading it so we can be supportive of the existing regimes with, with, it, with whom we have all our relationships in place, uh, and they're leading the reform. And I'm contending that they kind of wanted to see that from everybody. They would have stuck with Mubarak if he'd done it. And in Bahrain, they did stick with the government uh, even when they didn't do it. Which shows that uh, even though they say they don't want to support dictatorships anymore and they should be supporting uh, the will and the rights of the people more, uh, there are limits. And my last two points will therefore be about Libya and Syria. And it might be quite nice to be looking at pictures for a change. Libya.
I have an argument as to why the Conservative government would have decided when it did, and David Cameron in particular, not unlike Sarkozy, to grab a moment of opportunity, and why they would see it as a moment of opportunity in Libya for regime change when they didn't exactly treat it as a moment of opportunity in Egypt or Bahrain. And it has to do with the fact that Gaddafi was an embarrassment and the British companies that had started to do business in Libya since Tony Blair signed his deal in the desert with Gaddafi in 2004 had discovered that it was not an easy place to do business with. There was disenchantment with Saif al-Islam when he started echoing his father's horrendous invective against the people of Libya. It would have been very hard for the Conservative-led co coalition to defend Gaddafi when he started talking the way he did. And they saw an opportunity. They were not the ones who signed the deals with him anyway for a clean break. And it just so happened that the military chiefs were able to tell them that there is something we can do with air power and sea power and without boots on the ground. The UN obliged with a resolution that said force could be used to save the people of Benghazi. Uh, the Libyans obliged by producing a relatively cohesive opposition and some adept diplomacy overseas. And then the Arabs clinched it by deserting Gaddafi in the Arab League and saying, please do something. Now, unfortunately, almost none of those conditions are present in the case of Syria. That said, my impression is that this Cameron-led government here in Britain would dearly like to do another Libya in Syria. Because some of the aspects of the Syrian situation compute with what created an opportunity in Libya. But they have been warned in no uncertain terms by the military that in the case of Syria, it will be a quagmire. Uh, it's not easy to draw the lines. There would be casualties even with just air power intervention. Uh, there would be more men and women in uniform, European, British uniforms doing the dying uh, and given the situation in Afghanistan, which is now slowly but surely being recognized as a failure, and given what happened in Iraq, uh, they are being told wisdom dictates that you don't start because to finish would be like another Iraq. And if you consider that finished, of course. Okay, that was... 50 minutes, not 40, I'm sorry. That's fine. Thank you very much.